Bonsoir à toutes. Good evening, everyone, and welcome for this last roundtable of the day, the Not Innovation Forum, and for the uh, so the last of three debates organized jointly by Le Monde newspaper on the topic of crises and civic innovations. So the first roundtable was about understanding the crises, then uh, managing crises, which ended some 15 minutes ago, and now we are going to. Uh, turn our uh, gaze towards the future, anticipating crises. So if we've been, you've been watching us uh, since the beginning of the day or the beginning of, of the afternoon, you already know it, but in case that's not the case, you can send us your comments and questions via Slido. You can uh, sign up on um, the Not Innovation Forum website or through the Le Monde Facebook page. We have with us four guests. Anne Bouvreau, first of all, you are the head of the board of Technicolor, providing services for the creation and distribution of digital pictures, 3D pictures, and electronic equipment. Uh, you are also the head of the Abiona Foundation, which uh, I discovered is the name of a Greek goddess invoked by those who are about to start a journey. So uh, you're, it's a foundation which reflects on the societal impacts of AI and data. Ange Ansour, you were a translator at the Foreign Office and then you became a primary school teacher and you understood quite quickly that, uh, as you put it, the French uh, schools are not quite ready to prepare uh, young uh, pupils to the future, the world of the future in certain regards. And you want to help children to help uh, them cope with the rise of new technologies and the challenges of uh, climate change. William Aucan, you are an architect from Nantes, actually. You are part of the 150 people who have been uh, drawn at random uh, to um, take part in the climate convention, which we've uh, referenced a lot today. You were in the housing working group, which uh, proposed things such as uh, the fight against the urban sprawl or uh, the, um, the you know proposals for uh, energy efficiency and housing. And Nicola Hazard, you're with us. Uh, uh, you are a special uh, advisor for social and inclusion economy uh, for the European Commission. You've created a, a global uh, company uh, in the field of the social and inclusion economy. You've been uh, recognized as a young leader uh, in the mid-2000s by several foundations and institutions in the world. So I would like to start with a topical question uh, to the four of you. I mean, the nature of the crisis itself, the scientific nature of, of, of the crisis is not exactly your specialty, but um, let's try and anticipate. The crisis has been raging for close to a year, so do you think that we could have anticipated it, and if not, uh, why? What, what was the problem? Anne Bouvreau, I'll look at it through the lens of AI. So anticipating it uh, one year ahead, probably not, but on December the 30th, 2019, that is nine days before the WHO declared a state of crisis and of pandemic, 
AI systems, especially the Blue Dot system based in Toronto in Canada, raised the alarm. How? By analyzing information found on social media, Chinese social media, Baidu and WeChat mostly, messages such as weird pneumonia or unexpected diarrhea or cough, and basically the system said something is happening in Wuhan. So nine days is not a lot, you may say, but one of the fields in which AI is, is, is well known for its predictive powers is volcanic uh, eruptions, volcano eruptions. Uh, and even with a few days or hours in advance, you can save many lives in that case. So a few days is, is a lot. You cannot count on AI to warn us months ahead uh, on, on crises such as this one. Uh, we'll come back on this. Uh, William, I, 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 you were um, chaffing at the bit there. Can we anticipate crises? Well, it's always a, a, a series of uh, reactions and chain. I mean, um, as a simple private individual, I understood this with the climate convention and the uh, sustained training that, that we were provided with. Is it too late? No, there's still a lot that we can do, but we, can, we, we cannot afford to wait too long uh, for too long either. So this uh, climate convention, um, stood at the crossroads of two crises, a political one with the Yellow Vest movement and the ensuing negotiations which uh, brought about such an idea of, of a convention. And so at the crossroads of the Yellow Vest and the climate crisis, because we do not all have the same level of awareness of, of, of climate change and what it will entail. So this convention is really, uh, uh, again, stands at the crossroads of these two topics, if you will. The idea being to understand what our fellow citizens can bring to the debate. So you are, are all coming at this from your own angles, obviously, AI, the citizen convention, the public convention. So Ange, Ansur, um, I don't think schools uh, or the ed educate public education system could anticipate, no. But as far as analyzing structural weaknesses go, that we can do, that we know how to do. And the COVID crisis just was a magnifier of what was not going well. And uh, I think this is what uh, we are going to see, that the magnifier effect so we are going to keep analyzing this structurally to understand what, what's to come. Nicholas, I don't think we could have anticipated the crisis maybe a few days ahead, yes, but not really ahead. However, we could have anticipated the consequences more. And um, in the current situation, the current situation is due to two things, I think. We don't know whether it's a pangolin or, or a bat, or, but we know that it's definitely linked to a disease that is borne by animals, and clearly the current loss of biodiversity that we are witnessing means that man is moving ever closer to the wild and to wild animals because we are destroying their habitats. Therefore, the wall that used to exist between man and animals is is disappearing. The second factor has to do with the way that we've organized our economic system. I mean, we're complaining that we don't have enough masks, but we are in an ultra-connected, ultra-interdependent economy. The world is globalized and, and, and has been we've been too far into globalization, and we could have anticipated anticipated on that. And the way that, for instance, take the French economy, the way that it is, you know, composed, if you will, uh, tourism, R&D, everything's been globalized. And so we realize now that we have to bring everything back to the local level. And this is definitely something that we ha could have anticipated on. So 
it's uh, it's not easy to, to anticipate for this, but back in 2015, Bill Gates uh, said if uh, there is to be 10 million deaths around the world in the coming years, uh, it will probably be a virus, not a war, which fed into this conspiracy rhetoric, um, strangely enough. But... Um, Anne Bouvreau, coming back to your specialty, uh, AI, um, listening to a number of, of intellectuals and, and practitioners, you know, technicians of AI, they are keen to remind us that AI is programmed by humans. So can AI predict what humans cannot predict? Well, I believe, I mean, I'll be straightforward, I think the phrase artificial intelligence can be scary, but we're talking about programs that have been scripted and you know, they've been written by human beings using human data. So what, the important thing is to understand how it works. So, I mean, we all love sci-fi movies and sci-fi books, and we all love to get a scare. But as far as our daily lives is concerned, uh, we have to understand what it is about, what it is, and what it is not. We're talking about something that is man-made and that is using the data that we make available online or elsewhere. And we need to understand how this data come about, how it is being used, how, what are the risks involved in making them available, and what are the opportunities involved, because in a certain number of areas, they can be indeed very useful. When you talk about the societal impacts of AI, which is the you know the 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 heart of the of the work of Abiodas Foundation, the the foundation that 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 you run. Uh, so what are those threats? Uh, public liberties, um, intellectual property. Well, there are many challenges at Abiodas. Uh, we especially focus on questions of equity, fairness, and justice. So um, non discrimination, the proper uh, representation of all users of digital services and, and goods. Also, uh, private, privacy, personal data, the French privacy watchdog has uh, specialized in this for a long time, obviously. Um, AI is about algorithm data, but also very powerful um, machines, so very power-hungry machines, or energy-intensive machines. We know that uh, AI gets to decide who will get a transplant or who will get into this or that school. So it's very important that we understand how these decisions are made if we are to believe that they are fair. Uh, AI, you know, artificial intelligence, I mean, in French, intelligence doesn't mean the same thing quite, quite as, it, as it does in, in English. Uh, well, you have English speakers, you know, who, um, you know, believe that we should use a different word, but but it's 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 a very easy word, you know, it's it's um, it rolls off the tongue, so to speak. So, Ange um, Ansour, can we um, talk more specifically about uh, the? something that you created, and actually we are going to take a look at a little video called Let's Reenchant Schools. It's uh, an excerpt from a documentary. You can watch the full documentary online. Dans un projet s'aventurier, les élèves ont un rôle de chercheur. Here the students are pretending to be researchers. We have to try and share the joy of research, looking for solutions to the problems we set them. Do you use other things other than fractions? What else did you use? What other maths did you use? Students work for a year. They become researchers for a year. We're allowed to make mistakes. We don't give up. We keep going. School's about learning and preparing your future. Finding a job. This is really the enlightenment, if you like, for children. The, with this project, they're going to help discover where their strong points are. It helps them share out different tasks and it also helps them to be sensitive, aware of others, to realize we have the power to imagine. 
we encourage these students to become designers, to creators, to build the future. Their, f their world doesn't exist. The world of tomorrow doesn't exist. They have to create it. I didn't think about that before. It's good being a researcher. We're using our brains. Yeah, and if you do, if you become a good researcher, you can earn quite nicely, or later. It's a wonderful film, or you can see this on the website. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask them on our website, on the forum, and use our Facebook page, if you will. We're talking about anticipating crises, and I would like to tell you that this has been organized by Le Monde, so you can go on our pages as well. You will have find four pages dedicated to this subject. Uh, and we'd like to thank four of you because you all participated in the this edition. You talked so we talked about the seven tours, we talked about the school of research. Research is all about asking questions, formulating hypotheses. Do you believe that traditional school system doesn't do this? Well, I don't know what the traditional school is. It's it's all about form. However, what I can say is that students and teachers need what they need to strengthen certain elements and what we would like to strengthen with them is the following that the student at school is not just there to talk about the transmission of knowledge but that the, they could go to the other side of the question it's like when you go into the wings and see how question how education is created and then doled out so they're asking questions they're creating things without you know obeying all the traditional codes about producing knowledge and validation and the circulation of knowledge. And we have to encourage curiosity. You know, if you mix that curiosity with a lot of rigor and responsibility, this could be the key for, for children and for students, for, for teachers. I'm not going to pose the question I wanted to because I don't think there's an answer. You know, do, are we creating citizens who are able to anticipate crises in a better fashion or not? Like I say, I don't think there's an answer to that. But you did talk about traditional schooling. We touched on that. Perhaps we could agree that in many classes today, we ask our children to receive, to take on board knowledge which is being handed out to them without really discussing it, without, uh, you know, saying I don't agree or why. Now, if you have children who are following your program, are they, why are they going to behave with teachers the following year who are going to say, well, we know you did that last year, but that's not what we do here in this classroom. Well, no, it's not always going to happen. Education through research, we have the state of, con of cognition, of conscience and transmission. We know this is all very important, but what you have to do is deal with the transmission. We don't ask students to validate or not the legit legitimacy of knowledge. That's not what we're doing. The, what we're saying is take on board this knowledge and ask you yourself what you're going to do with it. William, could you talk to us? You, February 2020, you talked about your citizen, your participation in the citizen convention. Personally, this was an experience for you, something that changed you, which strengthened your convictions, made you more aware of the, the absolute need to act. What changed and how have you changed? Well, it's a very interesting question for me. What happened? Well, when I was called, uh, I was thinking, OK, I, I'm not really involved in politics anymore. It's very far removed from me. It doesn't interest me because, as you heard earlier, I'm working, I've got two young kids, I haven't got time to go to meetings, etc., etc. So when I got the call, uh, this, I suppose, appealed to my curious nature, and I thought, well, let's go for it. The first couple of days, you get a great deal of information, perhaps that you've heard constantly, but you haven't integrated, that you haven't really taken on board. And this experience allowed us, in a closed room, to get out of our daily confines and it allows us to really just dwell on one subject and for me it was a total shock to see that we weren't going in the right direction and that we, we who didn't really, we didn't know this but they had come to get us to help them 
come up with solutions and proposals, political proposals. So there was a great deal of reading done, a great deal of personal application, and we all felt that we were reborn into a, a, another life. More than the initial combat that we had of daily struggle, etc., we were involved in something new. And what I thought was rather wonderful at the end of this experience was that we arrived at a consensus. We were all equal and faced with this information. Perhaps we have information that the other 70 million French people won't have, but we, within our group, were able to share this information. We were able to talk and to discuss and to debate And to, we were able to reach a consensus in subjects which sometimes where politicians don't. This awakening, how could you produce this then without locking people up? I know this was voluntary, but you know, how can we share that with the other French or other French citizens? Well, I think there are many things, many things are done but we don't necessarily get on board with what's happening. Although when we talk about climate, we've just seen what's happened in the VAR in the south of France. And even, even here we ha with Hurricane or Storm Alex, we had some fairly brittle winds. Climate we cannot control. We can't actually control the meteorological phenomenon. What we can do is put actions in place which will have repercussions on our planet in the long term. Now, when you do that with 70 million people, it will only work is it, it will only work if everybody passes on the word, if citizens pass on the message from one to another to make sure everybody's involved, if we all share our feedback. And that's what we're trying to do. Nikura, as our, the transition is very easy because we're talking about emergency, immediacy, we're talking about urgency, we're talking about absolute need. You brushed. You published a, a, a paper, a call for a world war, almost. You're talking about guerrilla. It's a guerrilla attack. You know, how do you propose to do this? Well, yes, this, as you've heard yourself, my colleagues just told you, today we're in a situation of dire need and policies aren't enough. We have to move forward into action. Uh, you talk about ecological transition. We have to go beyond that. We're no longer at a stage where we can talk about transition. Transition is long and it's time consuming. We have to be radical. We have to be drastic today. We have to change the way we produce, the way we consume, the way we live. And today, the challenge in front of us, in front, in light of this, is we, we feel that we're not making any headway. People are not respecting the Paris agreements. We change things constantly. So the challenge is ginormous. You can't have small measures in place and hope that they're going to change the world. I no longer believe in the policies. I think sometimes the policies are blocked, even if they are well-meaning, the lobbies, the divergent interests and lobbies that prevent, that hinder progress. We And this all of this is preventing us from moving forward. We could have a top-down approach. If the, the elected officials were doing that, we could do it as well. But we can't do it. And the way we work in our kind of democracy, it's no longer possible to do so, for me anyway. But guerrilla, in a guerrilla warfare, there are, there's death. But wait a minute, the de dead people already exist, if you like. You've got people dying every year. And this is the WHO who die from pollution. 50 million thousand people who die in France from pollution-related illnesses every year. They, that's huge. Thousands of people in Paris who are suffering from pollution-related diseases which end in death. So why am I saying guerrilla warfare? Because there are people who believe, who have values, and who want to change things, and they perhaps are not coordinated and structured and they're spread out all over the place, but they have solutions to change things. They have the tools to do so, to transform our economy and, and our consumerism, and, and, and they are the people who are getting organized, and they're the people who are going to change things by organizing the battle at local level, not at national level or at European or international level, but at local level, because it's locally, that's going to be the source of action. That's where we're going to identify the stakeholders, you, myself, any one of us. We can change things in the village, in the, in the town, 
at a small scale. You can change at home and then in your community. And that's the guerrilla aspect of this warfare. And that's why I'm using this as a comparison. The, the, the deaths related to this already exist. This is ecological guerrilla warfare, but it's one that implies action. There is, and in guerrilla, you understand the sense of urgency, the need to act now. And we have to act now. We have the keys necessary in order to impose our model and to make sure that we make a definitive switch so that elected officials with their policies listen and follow the models that are implemented. So they will be in front of a fait accompli and they will transform at microeconomic level. Is this a... Joanna Roland, she doesn't know, she wasn't sure that it was perhaps local, the response. We're talking about deliberative per, um, democracy, including health crisis. I don't think there's any limits to who can partic participate. Of course, Vox Populis cannot replace scientific data. But she, she said that you could do it. Now, do you think that's true? Absolutely, I agree. That's where we're going to start. That's where going to be the, the heart of the argument. We have to, yeah. When you have a crisis, you can see how robust people were and whether they were robust locally. That's where it started. There are many things which exist which were not covered, for example, in some policies, things that are not covered by journalism or by focus groups. People are not highlighting the initiatives which really helped us move forward. I would all like to hear what you have to say about scale and then we'll take about your questions on the forum, on the Facebook page or on our website. But first of all, I have a reference for you. First of all, obviously, I encourage everybody to read your work. And then I think it, it, it seems appropriate now to talk about Le Grand Vertige from Pierre de Crozet. This has just come out. This is a book which basically addresses the same question as you in a, a fairly uh, romantic way sometimes, but it's extremely very radical. So when we talk about scale level, what do you think, Ange? It's the same question, but, you know, if we apply it um, at school, is that where the revolution is going to begin? Is that where it should begin? School is interesting because you have school at all the levels. You have micro-interaction of apprentices and learning between students and their teacher. And then at territorial level, you have Nantes and its metropolis. You've got the establishment and the state. And then there's the macro-state, uh, the constraint between a nation and its scholastic system, etc., etc., etc. But it's also a universal skill. By passing on knowledge and values, we are talking about a, a, a society that will endure and be present in the next 30 or 40 years. So it's global and it's long term. So we cannot isolate any subject. I don't know how we can isolate levels or scales of learning, whether it be upstream or downstream. We're really touching upon every level. And there's something very interesting to be heard here. For some time now, teachers are building a, an autonomous community For example, if they want to talk about climate, they realize that there is the, t the techniques in place, pedagogically speaking, and there is a kind of reinvention of their role and the role of school in the upcoming debate. And of course, the, the climate is one which calls speak to us all. Next question. Well... I want to try and give you a data or AI vision. When you have major programs at national or world level, we don't understand, we get worried, we, we talk about the transparency of algorithms, etc. I think data has to be open and available to all. This is paramount. And I think it also has to be representative. If you're just talking about COVID-19 data, where we look at trace, tracing, tracking and tracing, looking at the number of people who are ill, the number of fatalities, and it's very useful to look at these statistics city by city, country by country. But it's important that this data be available to one and all. You can perhaps suspect some countries of not having been entirely transparent with their data, but in more democratic countries, we could also say perhaps we haven't had access to all the data either. In the United States, for example, 16% of the population 
is Hispanic or of Hispanic origin. And, and in the studies, they've shown there's 1% of Hispanics who have felt the impact of COVID, so they're not being properly represented. And you can go even further. There are some areas that are not represented. So being representative or being represented at local level and then, of course, uh, being present according to other criteria is important, but the, the, what's critical is that the data be available to everyone. Okay, there's a burning question here from William. The slow, small step politics is finish, uh, finished. However, radical suggestions for the climate convention are not accepted by the government. Do you agree? Well, I want to come back to this question of scale because the consultation of the Citizen Convention had a national flavor to it. Normally, consultations are, are normally of a much more local flavor. Now, what we realized was that it represented 150 people from around France. But finally, we were able to reproduce 149 measures which really trace a roadmap for the government for France so that we take part in this fight against global warming. But with time, and time is moving forward, and we look at the measures within the convention, there's something that sticks, there's a sticking point. Because we're moving forward slowly. I understand that one has to be prudent, certainly. However, the national scale is, seems to be very far removed from the citizen and the local level can perhaps give the citizen something back and help us move forward on this subject. And I hope that this civic convention will not be a failure to allow for more local development. Political and radical decisions then, what can I say? I'm one of the citizens that thinks that what we did was really the minimal, the minimum of what we can do in order to reduce our greenhouse gases by 40%. This is a question where we need support. We need to be able to go far in our response. We haven't asked for the moon in, in these questions and in our demands or our proposals. We didn't ask for the moon. We, uh, we look about regulation of advertising, protection of biodiversity. We're at 99% agreement on measures uh, or against urban sprawl. You know, this is all This is all uh, put together when you're fighting uh, urban sprawl. What are you fighting? You're talking about people living in further and further outside cities. You're talking about farmers selling their land so that people can build estates. So all citizens are involved there. This touches upon every aspect of our lives. And we are moving forward at small, at, at slowly, small steps. But this is the minimum that we've recommended. Can you show us what you were working on? Here's your book. This is it then, this is the proposals. These are the proposals contained within. Anne, I have a question for you, directly. It's not about catching up. Perhaps the person who asked the question didn't listen from the beginning, but maybe you could give us some examples. How can technology allow us to anticipate crises, which, you know, by definition, don't have any uh, uh, warning signs? You're saying that there were, that were extracted from data. Well, it's still a good question because, yes, what are the warning signs? You have to identify them when you look at technology, AI, the digital wing. They're looking for examples of things which have already taken place in the past in order to predict what will happen in the future. So very precisely, we can see what we're looking for. We've had... We've had cases before. I talked about volcanic eruptions. When you're beside a volcano, you can you can measure and you use that information for further detection in the future. But that's not the same when it comes to COVID because even if Bill Gates had him and other people who uh, had information in the past, they could say it was there was Spanish flu, there was the the flu in 1918, there was another number of uh, flu cases. Today. We're not sure that the, that the next crisis is going to be the same as the sanitary crisis we've had in the past. However, we know that there has been a similar episode in the past. And if you look at early warning signs, you're able to predict, uh, uh, you know, 
you're going to predict a certain crisis, but oh, maybe only with a few days or even a few hours of warning. Now, Frank, the call for guerrilla warfare is to really taking a great deal of responsibility. Has he decided to renounce change in order for the this? You know, what? Why? Why is he using this expression? Has he not got a smartphone? That's an interesting question. Tomorrow's world is, is all about renouncing things. It's seeing things and saying uh, what we're going to have to go without. I see. So I am involved in a posture which is going to tell that tomorrow's world is awful. That's fairly frightening. Nobody wants to live in that kind of perspective and that kind of world. That's not what I want. The idea is to say, how can we replace the things that we have today with other things, other means of action. What about travel? Today, we've seen with COVID, before everybody moved around, left and right, for no whatever meeting, with COVID, with the current crisis and the situation in, in place, we haven't stopped talking and discussing. We're doing it differently. We've discovered Zoom, Google Meets, other options. So we've found other forms of action. And I think it's important because we it's how we have to move forward. But there was a very concrete aspect to the question. You, you, ma'am, have you given up? You're not taking flights anymore? You're not using a smartphone? No, wait a minute. I'm, I've done personal things, but I'm not sure it's most interesting. Paris, Paris, Toulouse, I used to do that all the time by plane. Now I take the train. That's what I'm doing at a personal level. But that's not really very interesting because what I want to re reiterate is that more than 50% of greenhouse gases are created by 70 companies around the world. So you, you, if you want to pee in the shower and, and say you're going to change the world, that's great, but peeing in the shower serves no purpose. This is his example, not mine. And so you're not flushing the toilet. But if you flush the toilet every second time, that's the same as peeing in the shower and you're not using all the products that would have an impact on the greenhouse gases once it's flushed and the water usage, etc. So that's what's important, to have an idea in mind of where the priority is. William, would you, would you like to react to that? Well, of course, I think we have to move forward in that vein. We've understood that we're not going to become superheroes, you know, not we're all going to wear capes. So, what does this mean? It means ev that every human being on the planet has to start thinking about where they can act, where they can have an impact so that collectively we can mitigate the climate change catastrophe. These spectators tell us that there's a financial crisis, there's a democratic crisis, there's a health crisis. Uh, is it not just impossible for us now to anticipate or forestall any kind of crisis? Well, I'm not sure I've got the best answer, but I'll try. I think that today the world has always had to face some kind of crisis. If you look back, you had the Hundred Year War where for a hundred years war was con constant. There are many books today on violence and the decline of violence. We've got a lot less violence in the world today, apparently, than before. Less uh, knife attacks or, or, or weapon attacks than we used to have. So in some fields, we have made progress. In, in health, we've made progress, let's face it. However, today, we what we can see are global crises rather than crises which were very regionalized or local in one country or in one region. Now we're talking about viruses that fly around the world in a matter of months. We have democratic crises, we, which we've witnessed in many many countries, and of course the, cri the climate crisis, which is global. We have some which are more frightening than others, but really, you mustn't, well, that yes, you mustn't believe that yesterday's world was just fantastic either. But you're talking about global, global and going very, very quickly, I suppose. Yes, things are going very quickly when we're talking about COVID. But with the climate, I wouldn't say we've gone particularly quickly. We've been, we've been take, dragging our feet there. And, you know, for several years now, we've been working on how we, we can replace several hundred years of damage. 
when I was thinking about the financial crisis and the rapidity with which this crisis can contaminate the entire world, I was thinking about 1929, for example. We're talking about revolutionizing education uh, and internet users talking about the states. Do they have the means and the will to do this, to revolutionize um, education? Well, I don't believe that we're the, the bedtime story that tomorrow's world is going to be great and we're going to change everything. But there are two different things. I'm not sure we have the means, but we live in a very rich country, so we should have the means. We have always said, yes, education is costly uh, when it comes to the GDP. Well, maybe it doesn't cost enough of the GDP because when you educate, you invest. It's not an, it's not an expense, it's an investment. And I think if we did had that mindset, we would go further. When you have school, you need democratic consensus. Do we want today, all of us here, all of us listening or not, do we all want a public school system which is ambitious, like the one we saw in the video because that was the public school? Do we want... Uh, this is a priority at school. Do we want... We, you saw the teachers in the school, the working with children who've come from impoverished backgrounds or often from um, migration. You know, do we want them teaching in the best schools? Is that what we want? Do we want to pay more taxes? Do we want to give more time for these people to educate themselves and to train? Can we accept that it costs more to, to send these ch teachers through education to pay them better so that the children are going to have a better education, or do we just do our best for a very democratic model, which to do the best for our own children? This is a societal choice. So it's not at state level, it's at our level as, as well that we have to make that kind of decision. Well, that brings us nicely to the next question, when you do the, 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 the di dichotomy between the individual and the, the local authority. We'll look about solutions. How can we change people's minds? How can we change this Western individualism? Through school, <laughs> you saw through my film, when we're making children cooperate and work together, these are not just words that we use lightly. The practices that we come, theories that we put into practice. I don't know if it's particularly Western, but I think there's a contract, a contract between citizens. I want to pursue this idea of, not perhaps of school, but of the youth of today. Nikita, you were saying, in the article that you wrote uh, during this event, the millennials think that it's essential to live in a democratic world. Must we change the system then? Do you not think we're already in one? No, this is a problem. This figure was a study, that, this is from a study that was carried out in the United States. This was a, a third of millennials believe we should live in a democratic you know, society. And this is a a study which is not really empirically based. People are looking at society, looking at proposals and saying they don't serve any purpose. People look at the theories, look at the conspiracy theories, etc. And everybody's frightened by what's coming out. Everybody's realizing that life, the life that our parents had was perhaps better or the lifestyle was better than one we have. And if we could even have half as good, it would already be a quite an, an, uh, an advantage on our children's lives, you know, what is that going to be? So it's a very negative trajectory. And people say, well, you know, finally, democracy, what purpose does it serve? What, what do we gain from it? There's a social crisis, a demographic crisis, a health crisis. Perhaps we should change the model. Democracy is not really working if we're voting for this. And I think that's where we need to strike. That's where we need to ask the questions. Anticipate the crisis, does that mean we're getting out of the democratic process at all cost? William, what do you have to say for all that? It's a real sport, I suppose, for democracy because this civic convention is a participatory, participatory democratic act. How do you convince people of the virtues of democracy because when you talk about warnings and how 
and having warnings of uh, crises. Well, let's look at the abstention levels when it comes to voting. And that abstention level might serve as a warning for the subsequent crises. Well, lot drawing, which was extremely democratic at its time, can help us to understand, to, to de-block, unblock dialogue and hand the microphone over to people like myself who hitherto had never participated, never even had the hope to participate in any democratic process. And this was done by chance. You know, they drew the lots and I, and I won. I was included. The chances that this will happen to you is, is, is weak. They're weak. But the advantage was we were all in the same situation. And there within, we're going to find plans which are an ethos which are going to help pull us together. And we were able to identify elements upon which we were all in agreement and hopefully offer an idea of what citizens really think. Have you anything to add, Or? Or? Well, there are great many crises in democracy. But if you look elsewhere, is it more democratic? I'm not sure. If you look out with France, do you mean? If you look around Europe or even out with Europe, we could ask that question. All generations have had crises. They've known crises. I'm not sure which crisis they're talking about here because they've put it in the singular, but the one that we're going through just now, is it worse than a, a world war or a financial crisis? Well, once again, I'm just giving you my reaction. If you compare COVID to the 1918 flu, I'm trying not to say Spanish flu, we know that there were 50 million dead. And this was just in the wake of the First World War, which had had many, as you know, <laughs> had created many, many dead. or well, they took place at the same time. And this, if you compare it to our current crisis, and where we've had, well, you have to say, well, we've actually got a lot less dead. But it's difficult, I suppose, to compare it to to past past episodes. But if you look at the financial crisis or COVID nineteen, that yeah, then definitely we've had worse in the past. Seven million de regarding the environmental crisis, seven million deaths due to pollution, that is more than any other disease. That's much much more than terrorism at global level, and I'm not talking about the European scale. So it's huge. I think it's the, I mean, we've never, as a species, we've never put our hands so far into the sand. And uh, the, the impact on children is, is just huge because they're first ones to, to be affected. And there's a taboo because no one really knows how to, to find a way out of that. You know, we have WHO figures, which, you know, are <laughs> facts, you know. Uh, so everyone can participate, uh, obviously, and uh, everyone can is entitled to their own opinion. Another question, do you think that uh, the climate convention is a success or the failure? So I'll have a, a mixed uh, answer, I guess. Um, I'm very proud of what we achieved with that convention, civic convention on climate. And I'm really still very committed because I was thrown into this, into this climate crisis overnight al al almost, and now that's all I, I can think of. So I want to keep going with this. So I don't think it is a failure because I'm part of the people who want to see what the government has to show for it and uh, that we want to see what will be translated into law. But we're aware that we need to do something and to do something quickly and, and strongly so that we can have actual an actual impact on the future. I hope France will do its fair share. I hope that this convention can be used as a precedent and can be used by all countries of the world, um, all those who want to do something about the climate. But currently, I am hopeful, but I am also uh, 
a skeptic, and the next step might be angry, you know. So um, I, I would like things to happen quicker than, than, than what is being announced here, but um, a comment more than a question from a, um, a, an internet user. Um, it used to be better, or everything was better before, but this is what we hear a lot, you know, uh, this nostalgic refrain, but uh, we've never lived as, as healthily as, as we do now. Uh, people seem to refuse the notion of risk now. It's partially true. We see that there is a, the, there is a, a decrease of the, the expected life expectancy in certain countries, like the U.S., for instance, at the moment. So, but what is inadmissible is that we've never seen such large um, economic inequalities. Who has access to health, for instance? There are countries where access to health is still very difficult. Inequalities within countries are growing and have never been as important. So uh, the key is, is also what world do we want for tomorrow? A few years ago, a uh, blue-collar person who wanted to have the same living standards as a white-collar person, white-collar worker, uh, had to work for 30 or 40 years, and now they have to work 150 years. So there's, you know, there's this idea that work doesn't pay anymore, and it's only the, 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 the happy few who have some capital in their hands who fare well. I think we have the, 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 the same references. I'm thinking of Steven Pinker, who showed that there is an ascending curve of, of in living conditions, uh, even in developing countries. Um, there are internal inequities, yes, but you cannot deny that there is a general improvement. You know, mm, you, know you don't die of hunger anymore. Uh, there are, you know, improvements across the board. However, regarding risk aversion, this is where the, 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 the logic stops. Um, is the climate crisis a risk and just a risk? I think this is where the logic stops, no matter what your economic theory is. I mean, the planet will, will do fine. What I'm worried about is 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 mankind. You know, it's it maybe will will survive, but I don't know how if it will come out. You know, on top. <laughs> I was also thinking of Steven Pinker's book, who shows that over a long period of time, and especially in developing countries, I mean, a lot of people who used to live in extreme poverty do not anymore, and there are still a lot of people, unfortunately, who still do, and we have to do our utmost to, to, to make sure that this, this disappears, obviously. But I wouldn't want to live 100 years ago. I mean, we were just fresh out of the First World War. There was, uh, you know, flu, the 1918 flu. As a woman, I clearly wouldn't have had the same uh, opportunities. But it's obviously, it's not a reason not to face today's problems, uh, honestly. And the climate crisis is a huge problem. Well, in the coming months and, 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 and weeks, weeks and months, um, we know that a lot of people are going to slide right back into poverty, or extreme poverty, because of the health crisis. So someone is telling us these pseudo citizen consultations. This is not me speaking. I'm just reading out the, the message. Um, aren't they very useful to dampen or appease certain social movements? I think a social movement is always beneficial. And uh, um, expressing your discontent is what democracy is about. Now, when they talk about pseudo consultation, no, it was really a consultation. I mean, it's really... Uh, they chose 150 profiles out of 300,000 profiles. So um, they really had a representative sample of, of, of French society. And so it will remain a great, a gr you know, great material.
um, in a great outcome. We were skeptical at first because it was really new, but we really felt supported by others like us, first of all. Then the experts came and see us, NGOs, and now political representatives come and see us and support us to go one step further. So it's really everyone's in the same boat, and everyone was around the table at some point uh, at the national level. But uh, I would have liked to have this is your opinion on, on on this consultation. What's your take on this? Well, I stood on the outside of it, uh, looking in, but I, th I thought it was great. I think we gave it a lot of ambitions and responsibilities because it was the first of its kind and a very uh, emblematic subject. And obviously, you will tend to think that it's either a great success or great failure. If some, you know, if something good or bad happens to it, but uh, it's not that clear cut. I think if you reverse the sentence, so basically we were sort of uh, stymied or stuck with these social movements, and so we created a convention out of it. And it is true in a way; it it, it is a, a ramification of the Yellow Vest movement. Uh, of the uh, eco tax, etc. However, is it going to be an answer to all the problems raised by social movements? I'm not sure because you know, economic vulnerability is still there, housing vulnerability is still there, um, fuel poverty is still there. So, I'm I'm not sure that it is likely to answer all these. Uh, questions. So may I turn to each of you for just 30 seconds um, on the following question. I mean, if you can make a, an accurate prediction, you'll be as famous as Bill Gates for his 2015 quote. Uh, so my question is, the next crisis that France will have to face, what, what, what is its nature? What do you believe will be its nature? Ange? I don't know, but I know that public education is already in a crisis, and the recent um, surveys have shown that even the best elite schools in France have seen their results deteriorate over the last few years, so that's very telling. Oh, knowing what I know now, I believe that climate change is going to well, bring a lot of heat, physically speaking. And so, uh, and obviously, countries in the south will be even more impacted. But I think the, the sheer heat in France is going to be a, 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 a very uh, important topic because the climate in Bordeaux will be transposed, if you will, in, in Nantes, and the climate of Algiers will be the new climate of Marseille. So this is definitely something that we need to plan for. No, even with AI, I wouldn't, you know, uh, venture a guess as to the next crisis. Well, uh, the gentleman stole stole my answer, but uh, obviously this is an environmental crisis that, that is looming and that is already there. And in the south of France, we have seen recently the floods and, and the extreme weather events. But there's also a democratic crisis which is going to gather pace, even more pace. And there is mistrust in the face of public authorities. It's not just in France. I mean, everywhere in Europe, we are seeing the advent of authoritarian regimes in the European Union. So it keeps growing, and this is of major concern. So thank you. Thank you very much to the four of you. Thank you for all of those who followed us online and here. Tomorrow, we will have the second day of this great in Not Innovation Forum, so do come back on the website. Um, Your documentary will be available online uh, starting tonight. It will be also available on the uh, 
uh, website of the Third Republic French Channel. You can also take a look at the uh, Climate Citizen Convention. Obviously, you can take a look at the work of the Abionas Foundation. Especially, you can read more about all of this in a supplement by Le Monde newspaper published today, and you have access to a lot of articles on this topic on the Le Monde uh, website. So thank you very much. We will see you all tomorrow.